Good afternoon. Um, I hope everyone can hear us. Oh, I thought everyone had managed to join, but I see a couple more trying to join now. Um, but I just wanted to sort of <laughs> welcome you all and to kick things off really. Um, and hopefully if people fall out of the way, they can join a bit later and um, welcome uh, to everyone. But we, if, we, if you can't hear the whole session, um, then it will be recorded. Uh, it's being recorded right now, in fact. So uh, you won't um, miss out, at least on the information I'll give, even if it may be harder for you to give uh, questions. So I shall start here, just with a little um, explanation of how we are going to uh, all talk together. Um, so, um, I don't know how many of you have used Blackboard before, but um, if you want to use the microphone, there is an icon uh, sort of at the bottom of the screen in the middle, which you have to click on first before you can uh, use it. Otherwise, you can use the messages. Um, there's a little um, speech bubble uh, on the left at the bottom of the column on the right hand side. Um, uh, which has a, a number of different icons you can press, including the settings one, the, the share content one, and the, the members of the group as well. Now, in terms of managing how we we speak, what I'm going to propose is that um, I'm going to present, uh, first of all, let you know a little bit about our programs, and uh, then I'm going to uh, open the floor for, for questions. Now, I'm very happy to be interrupted uh, during my presentation, but you'll see that there's a little icon at the bottom um, which, for which you can raise your hand. Uh, again, it's, it's near the, the microphone and video uh, settings. Oh, I've just realized I've got my video turned off. So, uh, guys, this is me. I, I think you can see me. Um, before I go any further, um, can any of you hear me? Um, if you can, just write yes or no in the speech uh, little chat um, function, where I've already put some instructions. Yes, excellent, Elena, that's great. Uh, nice to hear. OK, brilliant. So um, that's great that I'm coming across and not just um, talking to myself, as is uh, Times the case. Um, and so, as I was saying, you can just raise your hand in the air. There's a button here. Maybe you can see my raised hand or not now, but um, there's a button at the bottom of the screen where you can do that. And if you do that before and then turn your microphone on, uh, I, I will be able to, to, to respond to that question. Hopefully, I will, I will pick it up. So, I'm moderating all this myself, and that means that I might not get all of your messages. I'll, I'll try and keep a, a handle on them. Um, but if I don't, I'll answer them at the end. And that's why if you do want to speak, probably just raise your hand and I'll hopefully be able to see that quite clearly. And you can just, in, and, and that way you can ask me a question during the presentation. Otherwise, let's save it to the end. Just one final thing, when you're not speaking, it's good to have your microphone off because if we all have our microphones on, we'll be picking up each other's sounds and there might be an echo and it might be harder for us all to hear each other. So click it on when you want to speak, but please do click it off um, when you're not speaking. Okay, so having said all of that now, I'm going to start the presentation. As I said, my name is Andy Newsham. I'm, uh, well, I'm in two parts of SOAS. I'm in the Center for Development Environment Policy and I'm in um, Development Studies as well, the Department for Development Studies. I'm the convener of the MSc Climate Change and Development uh, program, and that's what I want to uh, speak to you today um, about. Uh, welcome to the session, Sarah, by the way. So I'm um, going to go through uh, some slides uh, which will hopefully clarify what it is that we're um, doing with this MSc program for you. And before that, I just want to take you through the presentation <coughs> structure. So what we'll talk about first is distance learning at SOAS. Um, and we're part of the University of London, as many of you will have uh, gathered by now, or previously known. Then we'll talk about why would you want to study climate change and development. I guess you'll have some of your own um, answers for that, but we've certainly got some reasons as well. 
Then we'll go through how study by distance works. Then we'll talk a bit about our student profile, the kind of people who tend to um, study with us. And then we will go on to look at um, some of the employers which uh, some of our students have gone on to work for, just so you get a sense of uh, you know, some of the key points around studying um, with us by distance learning. So we offer internationally recognized MSc programs um, by distance learning across three centers, including SEDEP. We've got over 4,000 students in 160 countries, of which over 1,000 study with SEDEP. Um, we've been offering distance learning programs within the University of London for 30 years, and the University of London has offered um, distance learning programs since 1858. So we've got a lot of distance uh, learning students across 180 different countries, and some of these, you know, sort of just sound like they're statistics which are there to impress you, but they're also important in the sense that um, there is such a long track record here in the pedagogy of distance learning. And whilst in SEDEC we've been doing it for 30 years, which is quite a long time, we also tap into the much richer, longer experience of the University of London. And every time we have launched a programme, we've had to um, sort of meet the um, pedagogical standards of the University of London and adopt them into the way in which we sort of uh, run our programmes. So there's a lot of thought that's gone into um, how you study uh, with us, which hopefully uh, you'll be the beneficiary of if, if you come and uh, study with us. So we've been in this game for quite a long time, by, in, in summary. So why would you come and study climate change and development in particular? Well, my answer to that would be that climate change is probably the most visible environmental problem in the Anthropocene. I'm just wondering, does everybody understand what is meant by the term Anthropocene? Some people do, some people don't. Just to um, clarify, the Anthropocene is a term which is supposed to describe um, a geological era which is marked by human signals in the environmental record. That is that um, we are supposedly out of the Holocene now, which is a stable period um, climatic period which has coincided with the rise of huge um, civilization stroke empires, uh, with the rise of sedentary agriculture, and which has permitted to a great extent uh, us to live in the kind of complex um, collective ways that, that, that we do, um, that we've moved out of this and that humans have become um, the most important sort of um, source of environmental change, if you like, such that it registers at this geological level. And within that, climate change is the most, if you like, visible environmental problem. Um, and professionals working on environment and development need to understand its implications for development trajectories. In the words of uh, Naomi Klein, this changes everything. And what she's alluding to there is that in her view, capitalism and the workings of you know, uh, industrial capitalism and its environmental um, problems it's given rise to over the last say 200 years um, are getting to a point where you know this is going to cause a crisis in capitalism itself it cannot you know really continue on this basis because the climate's going to disrupt its workings too much not everyone agrees but this is the question if you like at the heart of responding to climate change and development um, Clearly, we need to understand and find a better balance within the energy development poverty um, emissions uh, nexus because climate change is uh, linked to patterns of inequality which are already established in um, current development sort of uh, trajectories. If you look. we all have some sense of the gap between uh, rich and poor, and not just rich and poor countries, but rich and poor um, individuals. So. There's something uh, about climate change which exacerbates and, and interacts with those issues, which makes it a fundamental issue for development practitioners to take into account. Um, and of course, dealing with it is essential. Is, this is recognised, and dealing with it is essential to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm sure many of you know is a huge focus for international organisations like the UN, national governments, uh, but increasingly the private sector also. So 
That's why to study it. And what we're aiming to do with this program is to offer critical insight into how current development models uh, produce environmental problems like but not limited to climate change, which themselves threaten the objects uh, and the objectives of development. We want to pose the question of uh, what level of change do we need to confront uh, the problems you know, generated by climate change? Do we need reform or revolution to combat uh, Naomi Klein's question? To help students uh, develop um, analytical skills to solve adaptation problems and to identify low carbon development options, um, to contribute to the production of the next generation of environment and development professionals who are working on climate policy and practice, and to provide the most academically gifted students with a route into PhD studies on climate change and development, is, if that's what you want to do. Okay, what kind of skill sets are you going to acquire if you come to study with us? Well, as you might expect, <laughs> you'll get some training in um, research design, uh, project management, analytical and writing skills. These are all at the heart of, uh, of what we do. And, and of course, they're very important transferable skills for many professional contexts uh, that you may already be working in or that you may be looking to work in in the future. We're looking to foster a capacity for reflective, independent learning. Uh, critical thinking, of course, um, ability to not just um, understand complex ideas, but also to evaluate and interrogate them critically. Part of that is about the communication of complex ideas, um, but there's also other stuff that happens um, through uh, interaction with your peers and through combining your distance learning studies with other parts of your life. So through uh, the people you might meet on your on your programs and your, your modules, you might develop more intercultural awareness and sensitivity. You'll have to be thinking about uh, flexibility and ability to, to manage complexity in, 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 in your own sort of personal arrangements, if you like, in terms of meeting some of the deadlines you'll have for, for studies and combining that with the other things that you have on in your lives. There's online networking skills and the ability to analyze and identify the relevance of knowledge acquired through study to real world climate change and development problems. So on the one hand, we are interested in understanding what climate change is, what implications it has for what we think of as development, but there's also something very applied and hands-on in a lot of the focus that we, we bring to the way in which we uh, put the study material together. So, how can you study with us? Well, you can do it in a number of ways, depending on um, what best fits you, really. Most people go for the Master of Science, uh, which basically entails taking four of our modules, which adds up to 120 credits, plus the dissertation, which is an extra 60 credits of, of work, and doing this over a two to three year period. Two years is the minimum you can take to do it. Three years at the moment is the maximum registration period. Uh, that we have. But there are other ways, and I'll come on to, I'll flesh that out a little bit in, a, in the next slides, but I just want to mention briefly the, the postgrad certificate and the postgraduate diploma. If, for example, you're in a situation where you already have a, a master's in development studies or something, and you want to top up and show, you know, from one job, say, to, you're looking for another job where you want to get into an environmental NGO, and you want to be the person who brings a climate change sort of a relevant knowledge, you might find that you can use your existing uh, experience or qualifications and just get yourself a postgraduate uh, certificate, which is two modules. So that's um, 60 credits worth of study and which may demonstrate enough for you to get to the next step in your career progression. I guess it's um, good to speak to someone like me about um, which would be the most appropriate uh, model for you. Um, but these are some of the options you have. Another one would be, um, I mean, you might also use that uh, idea in the context of a postgraduate diploma, which you don't do the dissertation, but you do demonstrate you have very good postgraduate um, skills and knowledge in climate change and development. And again, it just might get you through that a bit more quickly, and it might be enough depending on your career path. Just one more thing to say about the postgraduate certificate. Sometimes we have people who don't quite meet the entry level um, criteria for SOAS, which tends to be 
you have to have a 2-1 or um, a GPA equivalent, which I think is about 3.2 or 3.3. Off, I'm saying that off the top of my head. We have to go and check that. Um, as the basic um, sort of um, level of what you've you've achieved in your undergraduate studies. Sometimes, if you have really relevant um, experience, we have a lot of people, for example, already working for the UN who already have a job in climate change, and if they have a high two two or you know a good, a fairly good but not quite there GPA in in, in their grades, then we can sometimes consider uh, that as entrance to the MSc program. But if you're some way below that, and it's not clear that um, you've got the level uh, you know, and the track record for studying at, at postgraduate level, and it is more difficult than undergraduate level, and if you had some time out, it can be even more difficult still. What we can sometimes do is recognize what qualifications and experience you do have and set you off studying for a postgraduate certificate. And then if you manage to pass those modules, you can be upgraded to start study with the MSc. So that's worth thinking about as well. Um, depending on the situation you're in, when, uh, if and when you come to make an application with us. Okay, so um, um, how does it work? Um, basically, uh, what we do is we have um, two 16-week study sessions per year. One of them starts in October and one of them starts um, in April and in that time you'll be studying 15 units and each week we suggest that you study a minimum of 15 hours per week. Of course you can study more than that but that's what it will take you um, probably to get through the, um, the module materials that we prepare, the, the study guides and the key readings for sort of for each week. Um, there's lots more you can go into than that, but that's a sort of, if you like, a minimum, which should see you through and get you learning enough um, to be getting uh, a good performance uh, out of your um, assessments, uh, which I'll come on to. So you will access the key readings and the specially written course guides that we have um, via the virtual uh, learning environment. Um, you'll have a dedicated tutor, uh, sorry, tutor and discussion forum in each module that you study with us. You get access to the SARAS online library and also to the University of London library. Um, and then you are assessed on a combination of assignments plus exams. So the three basic modes of, of uh, assessment are one of them is actually participation on uh, in, in our discussion fora, so sometimes there are particular exercises and there's a, they set up a discussion and you have to contribute to that in order to get some of the marks that go towards your final mark for the module. Uh, sometimes you have a situation in which 20% of the overall mark for the module rests on um, participating in 10 out of 15 of the discussion uh, for uh, that we have online. The point of this is to make it kind of compulsory to interact with with your uh, with your peers. And I have to say that the quality of the interaction that I've seen when we've done this has really been impressive. And and it it is an extra thing to do if you like during the week. But I think it's the sort of thing that really repays itself. And so that's a, a quite important and increasingly important part of of our uh, assessment. Um, and gives you the chance not just to learn through us, but through interactions with your peers. A group is always cleverer than an individual. We also have the you know, more standard forms of assessment that you will be more familiar with. Um, one of these we call the examined assignment, and it's, it's often some kind of essay in character. Sometimes it has that in combination with a, an online discussion element. Um, at other times it might even be a PowerPoint presentation or it might be a specific exercise related to uh, the learning objectives of, a, of, of uh, a particular module. And it tends to be around 40 to 50% of uh, the mark of the module. So as I say, it can vary in exactly what it is, uh, but if it's an essay style one, it tends to be about sort of 3,000 words. Then the rest of the mark um, is from a, an exam, which at the moment is still actually handwritten. What you would do is um, you'd go to one of the University of London's 
uh, exam centers, which they have a network of, which stretches right around the world. So there will be one in your country or at the very <laughs> furthest in the adjacent country. And, um, but most likely in your country. And you go there and you sit an exam for, for two hours and that's 50% of your marks, which sounds a little bit sort of 20, 20th century rather than 21st century um, learning. And at some point, once the technology is ready, we'll hope to switch to people doing exams on their own computers. But at the moment, that's uh, sort of a, a component of it, um, which again, pedagogically actually for distance learning is something that, that um, uh, we feel very strongly about in terms of the merits of exams. Okay, but that's basically how it works. Um, let me talk you through the dissertation, which is pretty important for setup programs generally. Um, the dissertation, of course, um, is an element of taking what you've learned and trying to do something with it. So hopefully you'll look across your modules and you'll look at some area that you're very interested in and you'll have a good sense of what the debate is in that area. What you're really looking to do is make an original contribution to that area of debate. So you're looking to figure out something that hasn't been said just yet, which forms the basis for identifying uh, research questions, which would be the basis of your dissertation. You could then go and try and answer those through doing desk-based re uh, research, such as a literature review, or we have lots of people, because of you know they live in places, they work for organisations which are research active or which need research doing in particular areas in order to be able to implement the programmes that they're working on. Uh, you can go off and do field-based research and you get research uh, training uh, along the way. So <clears throat> this is kind of broken up into four sessions across two years. And that's why the minimum you can do one of our programs in is, is two years. If you look at the diagram on the right of the slide, it has um, sort of a sense of how you might spend your time across years one and two. So. The first, if you look at the sort of the top right of the circle, there's a subject module one. That's the first module that you'll study, which will be your core module. Um, then you'll go on to dissertation study um, between the two 16 week periods of study. Before you start your second module, you'll start to think about your, um, your, your dissertation. And you'll be doing that also, you know, through the, the term in which you're actually studying your, your second module. So you'll come to the end there, there's, there's a bit more dissertation study, and by that point you're looking to put together this document here at the uh, bottom of the bullets on the left called the assessment or the assessed proposal, which is a, a detailed plan of the idea that you want to do and how, you know, what your questions are and how you propose to answer them with what research methods you propose to do that. And by that point you will have been assigned a supervisor who will help you figure some of this stuff out. Um, and help you uh, to, to write you know, the assessed proposal and who will mark it um, so that you get a sense there. You'll go on then in the second year um, to study your modules three and four. And between those, again, there's more time for dissertation study. You might use that to do field work, for example. And then you might from then on be you know, mostly working on your your fourth module, say if you're on track to complete within a second year, and um, doing a bit on of the dissertation on the side, but that then leaves you with an extra six months at the end to really focus on the dissertation itself. So that will take you through um, two years, and that's roughly how you would split up your time between module study and the dissertation if you're doing. Uh, master's program with us. So what is um, what would you actually get to study uh, module wise if you um, take climate change and development? So first of all you start with a, a core module which is climate change and development. Um, then you go to um, uh, list A where you, you take two of these three options. So you can study climate change adaptation and low carbon development or energy and development, but you have to choose two from list A. 
that gives you one option from list B, and you can choose any of the uh, the modules which are which are listed there: biodiversity, conservation, and development, food security, and social protection, gender and social inequality, global environmental change and sustainability, political economy, etc. You can you can see the options for yourselves, and there's a mix there, importantly, of things which are central to development policy and practice, and things which are bringing you uh, knowledge of environmental uh, issues and dynamics which are then relevant to uh, development policy and practice. And um, oh, someone has uh, asked a question. The module page at SOAS so online um, states uh, one list A, two times list B. Yes, uh, sorry, no, that's, that's not... Um, Hmm. Okay, actually, I can't confirm that. I thought that it was. Um, hmm. Actually, maybe you should go with what's actually on the page for now. I thought it was the other way around, but it may be that you choose one from list A and then you choose uh, two from list B. So um, sorry for the, for the mix up there, but let's go with what's actually on the website for now. I think that's been checked by a couple of people and maybe the, the confusion is in, in, in my head. That would still leave you with half of your, um, you know, minimum of half of your um, modules for your degree being on climate change and development. And if you wanted to, say, study climate change and development and all of the modules in this day, so that you were only really looking at the ones which are most focused on climate change, then you could you could um, do that uh, if you wanted to. Sarah, does that answer your question? Well, um, whilst you're, th oh yes, you do, brilliant, no, you're, you're welcome. Okay, so only a couple more slides left and then I really need to leave some time for you guys to start speaking. So just briefly on where our students are uh, located, we have a lot of people from Europe, in fact, a, a majority of people, but we have substantial um, representation from other places as well, not least Africa and the Americas. We've got less in um, the Middle East, uh, less in uh, Australasia and less in Asia, although those segments are all sort of gradually growing uh, as, as, as time goes on. And um, as you can see, we have a, a sort of, as is very typical actually of postgraduate education, um, we have about just under two thirds of our students are uh, women and just uh, over one third uh, are, are men. Uh, so um, that's how it works out in terms of the, the gender split, and you can see here on the top uh, uh, sort of bar chart on on the slide there, the you know the the, the different age groups of of students um, across our overall cohort. So that gives you some sense of um, who is studying with us and at what stage in their lives. We have people who come to us um, straight after their undergraduate studies or a couple of years after their undergraduate studies, or who pick up their studies sometime a little bit later on into their professional career between you know, their 30s and their 40s um, so that they can get to the next stage. We have a mix of both, but you can see that generally speaking, people come to us um, having gone out into the labour market and got a bit of work experience and then coming back to, to help them get to the next uh, stage. And finally, some of the people who uh, have been employed, uh, uh, some of the places where our students have gone to be employed afterwards, the United Nations, uh, International Fund for Agricultural Development, World Bank, Care International, World Health Organization, so a real spread of sort of um, kind of uh, international organizations, NGOs, um, government organizations, um, you know, all, all kinds of different um, sort of um, places where, where people end up. But, you know, clearly there's a, there's a sort of very um, clear sort of link to, to the development uh, sector. So anyway, you may be glad to hear that's everything that I'm um, going to say. Let me repeat what I said at the start, which is um, let's have a discussion now. You can all sort of uh, um, sort of chip in. So I think what I will do is 
Um, first of all, tell you and remind you that if you want to speak, you'll need to click your microphone on, which is one of the icons at the bottom of the of the screen. Uh, it looks like a, a microphone. Um, and before you do that, can you please uh, raise your hands uh, so that I can see uh, when to bring you in? So if you have a question, uh, I see. OK, so first off, we've got uh, Raman Gouda. So if you'd like to turn your, your microphone off, Raman Gouda. Sorry, turn it on. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I already was applied for this course. And I got confirmation from uh, your side for MSc certificate. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. You got confirmation of what? Uh, unconditional uh, offer letter. I got from your oh, side. Okay. 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 Uh, just yeah. I want to know the uh, yeah, scholarships part to apply like this. Right. Oh, so you're looking for scholarships to study yeah. with us? Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to type um, a little bit of this into the message box as well, so it's recorded there. There is a SOAS Research Scholarships page, um, but I'm not 100% sure that those scholarships at the moment are applicable for distance learning. So yeah. um, uh, regarding this, I also ma uh, mailed to uh, your person, and he said that as of now there is no scholarships for uh, distance learning. Mm, right. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Uh, and just I'm asking, is there any alternative to get uh, scholarships? Yeah, so I mean, the, depending on where you're from, um, there are a couple. So I am from India. I am from India. Right, okay. So um, one of the places you, that we have in the past had scholarships for and um, I don't know if they have an open call where you can apply to, to go wherever you want. They, I know they have scholarships that are linked to particular universities and particular departments and some of the on-campus masters, such as the on-campus masters program that I can be in as well as this one, um, that does have a couple of scholarships linked to it. Um, okay. The Commonwealth Scholarship. They, if they have an open call, you can apply for a study wherever you want. That's worth looking at. The other but it one, Okay, please continue. Sure, go on. Uh, please continue, continue. All right, so, so the other one is, um, and this is a great source for everyone, it's called the Grants Register. Now, it is an on, it's, it's recently become an online compendium as well, but basically it is a list of all of the grants that you can apply for uh, for study in the UK. And I think, well, it's not, I can't remember if it's just for studying, but it definitely covers um, studying and you can it, it, it lists all the, the grants in different ways so it could be according to your nationality so there are some grants for example where you have to be Indian for example to apply for them and nobody else can apply to them uh, to, or you may have to be email or you may have to be uh, from a particular um, I don't know ethnic background for example or um, you may have to have a background study-wise in, in, in a particular area or you may be looking to study a particular course, and you can search the grants register. Um, now you can do it electronically um, to look for any kind of grant that you might be uh, eligible for. Now, the thing about the grants register is that, I mean, I think it's, you know, you can't, it's not worth going out and buying. I think it costs about uh, 250 British pounds, but you should find there will be institutions with a subscription um, to it. So, for example, in India, I imagine that the British Council should have a subscription to it. And universities and okay. public libraries may also have one. Okay. Okay, thank you. We could also do questions by... Um, you know, by messaging. So whichever way you want to do it, you can raise your hand if you want to speak. Don't forget to turn your microphone on. And uh, if you um, want to put it in the messaging box, I can also pick those up and read them out and we can go from there. Okay, so Sarah, we've got a question from you. If planned dissertation topic is based on an elective module, 
which we won't take until the second year. Is that an issue? Well, <laughs> um, so yes, it would be. Um, I mean, unless you had prior knowledge of that, which you could say, okay, I know this subject. I know where there's a research gap. I'm going to aim to address that. Then what you'd be looking to do is to take that in your first year. If you find that, you know, you don't know what you want to do your dissertation on about, about in your first year, that's not a problem because you have three years overall to complete the program. So you can then study your second, sorry, your third and your fourth modules. And you can spend third year um, doing the dissertation if you want. Does that make sense? Yes, okay, good, you're welcome. Other questions? Anyone wanting to raise their hand or um, type something? Ah, here we go. So somebody else who can't turn their microphone on right now but has some questions on distance learning. How flexible is studying? I would like to continue working part-time during the course. So taking part in real-time lectures or forum discussions during the day might be difficult at times. Um, will this be based, uh, sorry, will this be part of the course or is it rather based on recordings? Um, so let's take some of these questions one by one. So how flexible is studying? So you can defer if you don't quite reach the end of a, a term having finished everything you want to do, you can then take it in year two or three if you need to, or you can, you know, if it runs in April and October, you can repeat it in October. Not every module runs in both October and April, but quite a lot of them do. So if you want to continue working part-time during the course, that will be fine. Um, there's no taking part in real-time lectures or forum discussions during the day. You, the, the whole um, premise of distance learning is that it is asynchronous, which is that it doesn't all happen at the same time. Say if there is a forum discussion, you have a week in which you can contribute. You don't have to like do it at 2.30 p.m. on a Monday or something like that, because of course, for people around the world, 2.30 p.m. on Monday will be a very different time. So um, we do sometimes have webinars like this one, uh, which are recorded, so you can turn up for it you know, at a time like you will have now, or you can watch the recording, which we are very much hoping other people will do with this one. And then are exams also taken online and in test centres? Uh, so if they're not taken online right now, you have to go to one of the University of London's uh, test centres and you have to sit the exam physically and sit there and write it. We're waiting for the technology to become good enough to do uh, all of this online as it stands. Now there was somebody who put their hand up and I'm sorry I wasn't able to respond at the time. I'm trying to look at the name actually. Uh, I think it was, uh, was it Athanas? Oh, you're welcome, Christine. Was it Elena or Athanas or somebody then it began with A who had a question. If you want to stick your hand up again, I'm very happy for you to say it to us or to write it, whichever you prefer. Hmm. Two new chat messages, very good. If planned dissertation topic. Ah, we've got a few. <laughs> okay, let me take these one by one. Uh, So, um, in terms of learning material, what would that be? Julia, I think you have to be a bit more specific with your question. I mean, in broad terms, you get a study guide where you'll have 15 units, one for every week you'll study, plus a week to write your exam and assignment in the middle of that. And you get a, a, the study guide has a sort of broad guide to the topic for each um, week of study. And then you have these key readings, which you, um, read on top of that to dive into and get more detail on the specifics of any particular area that you're that you're studying. Um, so let me know if that doesn't answer your question. Uh, Loris, um, sitting at an examination centre and handwriting your exams after 20 years is pretty ugly. <laughs> yes, I think that's a very common um, sentiment and 
we have had long debates about whether to have exams or not. And the difficulty with it is that so far the online technology is not good enough for us to be certain that we can eliminate cheating in the way that we can you know, eliminate it or at least very much reduce it in exam settings where you're writing by by hand. And uh, exams, of course, are always a, they're not necessarily the most popular of, um, of assessment formats, but they are arguably the best way for us to assess you, not just in, you know, in terms of say an essay where you go in depth into one issue, but across the breadth of a module to show us that you know not just about what's in unit 15, if that's what you write your essay on, but you know something about units one to 14 also. Um, Sarah's posted a note to the exam centers, so you're probably all ahead of me. Uh, and that's all the questions for now. I don't see any hands raised, but I think we're up to date. So any other questions or um, hands raising uh, desires? Okay, regarding the entry requirements. Yeah, if you obtained your first degrees in another country than the UK. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, who can you ask about translating the grade? Um, it, it kind of, um, it depends. This might go a little bit beyond my, my knowledge of our, of our application procedure. Essentially, um, there is a, an international body called NARIC, N-A-R-I-C. I'll just put that in here so you can Google it later. I won't in case I use up some of my precious connection and cut myself off again. Um, NARIC is a body which um, basically does this active translation and says, OK, so if you need a 2-1 to study X degree in the UK, what is that? What is the equivalent of that, say, in the United States or Ghana or South Korea or China or, or whatever? So um, what we will do is we will look at, um, at their information and we will make a decision sort of uh, based on that. So there is a sort of standardized way of doing this and uh, we will follow that in the same way that other universities will also use that database. Does that answer your question, Christine? Um, not sure. Oh, yeah. Yes, partly. So the responsibility to deliver the correct information on the grade. So what you'll have to provide is your university transcript. You'll have to demonstrate um, that you have got a particular grade and then we'll ask for the transcripts. So if you ask the university for that, if, the, if those are in English, then there's no requirement to translate. If they are not in English, then there is a requirement to get those translated. Um, yeah, I think that's the policy. Okay, so a couple more questions that have come up here. Um, regarding, well, this is Loris's comment. Um, regarding a dissertation, Loris uh, completed in 2014 environmental management and um, went more into economics. Uh, the supervisor assigned to me was an economist. We had a very nice relationship, but I would have preferred having someone more on the side of my dissertation is the supervisor not selected too early in the process uh, okay so i mean that's a quite it's a subjective question i can't give like a, an objective answer uh, to that the the policy that we we have is to match um whatever you want to do your dissertation on um as with, with subject area expertise as much as possible so we'd look to 
if you want to do your um, your dissertation on environmental economics, then we would look to get an environmental econo economist to be your supervisor. And we do this as much as we can. Uh, obviously, what tends to happen is that we are finite in the number of staff that we have. And then we also have a big database of people who um, supervise for us. So we can often get pretty close, um, but it's not always possible to get um, a perfect match, if you like. And you'll, that is a, a, an issue that you will find in most universities. In fact, the fact that we have something like 40 odd uh supervisors on our registration uh database means that we have more leeway than, than, than quite a number but of course it's never a sort of a perfect process for everyone so there is or there was a facebook um group especially for setup and the soas um central folks decided that they wanted a facebook um presence for all of SOAS and not for particular departments so sadly we don't have that anymore but it's out there somewhere and there are people who are signed up to it and uh, you might be able to look them up. What we can also do is think about um, for next time maybe trying to get a student involved who is currently studying that can give you a sense of how it is. Uh, Loris, I can't hear you, no, I'm afraid. I see you, you've dropped out of the session and you've come back now. Whilst you're, Loris, do you know where the, do you know that you have to turn your microphone on and that this is the um, icon near the, well, at the bottom of the screen, it looks like a sort of old school microphone. It is on, okay, right. Okay. So, um, Loris, you may have to type your question. In the meantime, I'm going to um, take a couple of questions from Sarah and then from Julia. So the course page also straight the registration period for the University of London is five years. Um, you wouldn't, okay, so that, that's a mistake because that's what it used to be, but it now is, has been, has come down to three years precisely because we want people to be finishing their um, studies more quickly and the way in which we've made changes recently is um, is allowing that to happen. So secondly, if you were to move geographically during the course, um, yes, you can change exam centre as well. You can do that. So Julia, I would like to ask how fees are going to change for EU students in the second year. I'm sorry, Julia, that is that is I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question because we don't know how Brexit is going to work out just yet. And, um, I, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to tell you. I can tell you what the fees are for, for now, but I can't tell you what they are for um, future years. I hope they stay the same, but I, I honestly don't know. So Sarah, recently done the course, and so far I find, okay, you've seen that Sarah, that's brilliant. <laughs> Quite shocking on the climate change threats we face indeed. Um, Loris will be typing his answer now. I'm sorry you couldn't speak to us. I'm not sure what the issue is there. Maybe again there's an issue at my end or something, but I certainly can't hear any of you. So I think what Loris touches on here is really important. Um, difficult to, to graduate while working. Uh, yes, there are there are a couple of graduation ceremonies that you can attend um, each year, but they may or may not coincide with or fit with requirements of, of work. Is that is that what you're is that what you're saying, Laris? Okay, very academic compared to other friends in different schools, but exactly what I was looking for. Okay, sorry, you didn't you didn't get me. I was just when you're saying that. <laughs> The examination was annual, which it, it still is, although for modules that run twice in the year, um, there are two different exam periods now. It's been difficult to me graduating whilst working. Could you just clarify that, please, Loris? Oh, yeah. OK, so this is the thing, right? This is one of the things that we have changed. We have more study sessions now. Um, and before it, and, and basically we have 30 credit modules rather than 15 credit modules. So Loris, who's been an absolute trooper, 
had to study eight 15 credit modules. So there was less work involved per module, but there are eight exams then to sit, eight exam and assignments to complete. Um, it is basically more work. And we were told that we were over examining people and that the, the burden of work, although it conforms the, you know, the Europeans Bologna sort of standards, it's, it was so far above the sector average that we've streamlined so that people have to do as much studying, but it's within shorter terms. So before we had 32 week terms, now we have 16 week terms and um, you'll only sit four exams and you'll only do four exam and assignments. So um, they're longer, the exam and assignments are longer uh, and you have to study more continuously. I mean, the, the, the flexibility of a 32 week term is that you can do it over quite a long period. Um, but it doesn't always help people to finish. And it's not always easy then to fit it in if you're doing that over eight modules. And that's why it's quite common for our students, uh, or has been in previous years for them to take four or five years. But now, as I say, we're looking at two to three year periods that, that uh, most people will go through with. And indeed, thank you very much for your response, Lars. I'm afraid I'm going to have to draw it to a close now because I'm afraid I've got another meeting to go to. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all very much for all of your participation. This session, as I say, has been recorded, um, so it will be available for you to watch and for anybody else to watch. And Elka, who uh, is our marketing person and who has been listening in the background from time to time, um, will email everybody to um, uh, to let you know what where you can find that recording. Um, just to pick up on that analysis point, there is a lot to read and you need to take seriously those 15 hours per week. Thank you very much, Alice. That is exactly the message I would want to hear from our current studio students. Uh, and you can, you, as Alice will surely tell you, you can do plenty more than 15 hours a week if you really want to. But uh, yeah, thank you very much, all of you, for joining. I've really uh, enjoyed our chat, albeit that it's been a bit sort of one-sided, uh, at least in terms of people actually physically getting to talk. Um, and uh, yes, good luck in uh, trying to procure scholarships. Um, yeah, no worries about the video. I, I don't know what that is. I think Collaborate is still a bit of a work in progress, but at least we've got this far and you've got the presentation slides now. So um, again, I'd like to thank once again everyone for their time. Um, I wish to wish you all well, hoping to get some applications from some of those of you who haven't put them in just yet. And for those of you that have, uh, like Raman Gouda, then congratulations on getting an unconditional offer. And thank you very much, Doris, for joining us at this point. And good luck to you, Julia. OK, take care, guys. Oh, Athanasia has one last question. Okay, you've caught me just before I leave. I've got a meeting to go for too, so I have to be quick. But yes, what's your last question, Athanas? Why can't periodic webinars? So why can't we have periodic webinars? So it is something that we're looking at. Um, the thing about webinars is that students always say that they want them, um, but the attendance rates tend to be between five to 10% of the cohort when we organize a webinar. So say for example, webinar is normally organized in the following way. Your tutor or your convener comes onto the discussion forum and says, let's have a Moodle poll. Let's find some dates that people can do. Uh, now sign up for one and then you get maybe say 20 people signing up. And then you often get two or three of those people and that's it. So it's something that we, we're wondering about how effective that is because it's they're really useful um, in lots of ways, but it's quite um, difficult to get people to sign up for them. Having said that, because we can record them these days, um, and I think we're starting to get software which gives us some sense of how many people actually listen to the recordings. I think you know the case is building, so it's it's an ongoing um, issue, and something that we'll be sort of coming back to. And basically, Athanas, if you want there to be webinars, then make this point. But as you have done today, very much to your credit, um, uh, turn up for them and get your peers to also. Right, sorry guys, I really do have to run. It's been great to speak to you all. Um, enjoy the rest of your days and 
uh, any questions, uh, my email is paid to us. There we go. Right. Okay. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.